people, erysipelothrix infections are frequently occupational. So those people in contact with animals are those who are most at risk. So whether it's veterinarians, butchers, um, or fish handlers, including people who work with not only fin fish, we said earlier it's in their slime, but also other seafood, including crabs. There's a few forms of disease. Um, erysiploid is the minor, the mild form where we see skin lesions. These are typically localized infections, oftentimes on the fingers or the hand um, where somebody's been in contact. And those lesions appear sort of two to seven days following exposure. In more severe cases, we can see systemic infections, including left-sided endocarditis, which is associated with a high mortality rate. Most commonly, this occurs in debilitated patients, so those who have some sort of uh, underlying condition that means they have a really good reason to get sick. In dogs, Erysipelothrix tonsillarum um, has been reported as a cause of infections. This species is not believed to be uh, pathogenic for pigs, although we don't have a lot of literature um, describing these infections. Um, so this is possibly good boards trivia, Erysipelothrix tonsillarum associated with mitral valve endocarditis in dogs. Just like the image we saw earlier from a pig heart, uh, this is the mitral valve of a dog, and you can see these vegetative lesions growing on the valve. Clinical signs of endocarditis in dogs include fever, uh, the recent onset of a heart murmur. These infections are treated with high doses of antimicrobials, over a long time course. And generally speaking, for erysipelothrix, penicillins are the treatment of choice. Recently, there have been reports of mortality in a variety of ornamental fish species in the United States. Um, and the way this was noticed, they had lethargic fish, they were hovering in the water, which is, I suppose, what a lethargic ornamental fish looks like. These animals also had hemorrhagic lesions on the fins and skin, which is a hallmark of sepsis in uh, fin fish. A recent study described a genetically distinct erysipelothrix species from 25 cases. So it was neither Rusiopathiae nor tonsillarum. And as it turned out with, with more study, um, they had a new species, um, erysipelothrix piscicarius. There's a lot of interesting possibilities for anyone who's interested in aquatic veterinary medicine. Oftentimes, the diseases seen in fish and other ectotherms are poorly studied. They aren't good homologs for human disease, and so we just don't know a lot about them. So anyone interested in uh, fish infectious diseases, I would definitely encourage you to look into research possibilities or, or a career um, in, in aquatic medicine. In the case of Erysipelothrix piscicarius, the organism seems to enter cutaneously before spreading into deeper tissues, although there's many questions that remain. So is there a carrier state? Maybe it's living in their slime. Maybe it's somewhere else in the environment. Is there an effect of temperature on virulence factor expression, on fish susceptibility, or on host range? There's many, many things which remain to be determined. And as you can see from these uh, screenshots of recent articles, this is a really active area of interesting research. As far as specimens to collect, um, on necropsy, you want to collect the liver, spleen, kidney, heart, potentially synovial tissues, and samples from long bones. I said uh, previously with the wild ungulates, this is one of the last anatomical locations to be invaded by bacteria post-mortem, and so it's a great place to look for uh, or bacteria causing sepsis, so whether it's poultry at necropsy or wild ungulates in the field. Recovery of the organism from skin lesions can actually be quite difficult. It tends to be present in quite low numbers. And then in dogs with suspect endocarditis, blood cultures would be an important diagnostic. And of course, as usual, we don't want to freeze our samples. These organisms can be delicate, and freeze-thaw cycles at minus 20 can kill them, making it difficult to get a positive culture. Erysipelothrix can be picked up using pretty standard culture methodologies. It certainly will grow on blood agar, although selective media can be very, very helpful, whether that includes a pre-enrichment with a selective broth. Um, there's many chemicals that Erysipelothrix is almost uniquely uh, resistant to, things like sodium azide or crystal violet. 
Um, also antibiotics. So agar containing canamycin, neomycin, and vancomycin are very useful. These bugs are easily identified biochemically um, or using multitoff, so not a challenge to ID them. Pathogenicity testing using a mouse infection model can be useful in differentiating between colonizing strains and those which are truly virulent, although this is really more historical as we move away from in vivo diagnostic tests. Erysipelithrix rusiopathiae has the ability to cause disease in a wide variety of hosts, so this does present a zoonotic risk for people uh, working with animals. Um, it's primarily occupational, so fish handler's disease, uh, working with, again, either fin fish or um, things like crustaceans, so crabs, butchers, slaughterhouse workers, or veterinarians. It also has the ability to infect other animal species. So if you isolate Erysipelithrix rusiopathiae from a species that it isn't commonly associated with, you should believe those cultures. Erysipelithrix tonsillarum is not known to be associated with disease in people, um, although it's not well studied. So I wouldn't consider it the same level of risk as a rusiopathiae, but I also wouldn't consider it zero risk either. Penicillin is typically the treatment of choice for treating Erysipelithrix infections, although pathological changes that are associated with infection may really complicate therapy. So those vegetative lesions on the heart valves, that proliferative arthritis, can make it really difficult to achieve adequate drug concentrations at the site of the organism itself. And so pathology oftentimes makes therapy more complicated. We do have some important intrinsic resistance, uh, sulfonamides, aminoglycosides, and glycopeptides, so vancomycin, which of course, as responsible future veterinarians, none of you will be tempted to use. Just one new term for today, and of course, a question for self-assessment. Mm -hmm.